Well, uh, can I say what a what a, um, a, a pleasure and an honour it is to give this um, this lecture? Uh, Stephen Paget uh, founded the Research Defence Society, um, a, a courageous um, person who's been an inspiration um, to the many scientists and others who have at times um, s suffered as a result of the criticism of animal research, but um, who. Uh, on balance have made an enormously important contribution to our, our understanding of, of physiology uh, and of, uh, of medicine. Um, it's um, it's a uh, um, uh, humbling uh, honour to look at the list of previous uh, lecturers. The first lecture was given in 1926 by Julian Huxley. Um, I want to talk about the question of, of the brain. Um, I think whatever area of science you're, you're in, whatever area, uh, not just biology, um, it, it, there is a, a wide recognition that the question of understanding the brain is, is a central issue for, for science. Um, in fact, an issue that raises quite deep questions about whether, why and whether human beings have the capacity to understand everything that goes on around them. Uh, after all, the organ of understanding is our brain. It's, a, it's an interesting philosophical conundrum to think whether we've been endowed with a, with a device that has the capacity to understand itself. So I'm going to um, consider the role of research on animals, but not just research on animals, in the growing understanding of how the nervous system um, works, and to do it by telling four little stories about pieces of research, um, two of which I've been involved in, my lab's been involved in, two of which um, I haven't uh, worked in, but I think there's some interesting um, conclusions that come from these four little stories. This is a view of the human brain. This is a photograph of the human brain. Some of you will recognize it. It's from Wilder Penfield's classic studies uh, during a preliminary examination before surgery for epilepsy, uh, trying to determine whether removal of the epileptic focus would cause catastrophic effects, particularly for uh, language. And he did it by stimulating the surface of the cortex around the suspected position of the focus. Um, in conscious awake patients, asking them what they felt or, or listening to what they said or didn't say, looking at the twitches and movements that were produced and so on. Now, I would imagine that most of the uh, audience fairly physiologically sophisticated, but for those of you who are not, I should point out that the human brain doesn't come with the little numbers on it. <laughs> uh, wouldn't it be nice if it did, because a large part of our task is trying to find out what, what is done where in the human brain, but actually much more interestingly, how it's done. Um, before I plunge off into nice stories about science, let's just set it in the context um, of the clinical need uh, to understand better the nature of the brain and the disorders associated with it. Uh, a fairly recent estimate of the, economic, the total economic burden of brain diseases, and I'm including psychiatric disorders, of course, in, in that. Um, the total burden in Europe was estimated in 2011 as nearly 800 billion euros. Um, many age-related, many uh, con conditioned brain, <laughs> brain disorders, are both psychiatric and um, neurological are, of course, age-related, and we have to keep in mind the demographics. 14 million people in the UK um, will be over what used to be called pension age um, by 2030. Um, even more sobering, I think it's fair to say that no, no <coughs> neurological or psychiatric disorder can currently be cured. Most, quite frankly, I think clinicians in candid moments would admit are not really adequately um, treatable in a, in a conventional sense. And worst of all, we don't even understand the pathological processes that underlie um, most neurological and psychiatric conditions. Pathogenesis is very poorly understood. So this is a huge challenge, both scientifically understa to understand what's going on in the normal brain, to understand the pathology um, that causes brains to go wrong, and then to move on to developing more adequate treatments um, and cures. And just to, you know, to uh, establish the scale of the problem, you, you know some of the numbers. The human brain has of the order of the, the same number of neurons as there are stars in our galaxy. And when you consider that each of these neurons has on average 10,000 connections from other neurons, then the total number of connections, and it's, it's of course connections that matter, 
total number of connections, a thousand million million, is simply um, staggering. Um, in fact, since um, that's uh, 10 to the 14, it, since um, 10 to the 15, since human life span is about 10 to the 9 seconds, it means that um, on average, over the whole of our lifespan, we are creating about a million neurons every second. And one of the most interesting discoveries in my lifetime in, in science is that that creation of new connections isn't all happening very early on, as was thought when, when I was a medical student 50, 50 years ago. Um, it continues through, through life. And one of the most interesting challenges is to understand how that property of, of adaptation, of change, of reorganization, of plasticity, plays in both to normal function and, in some cases, uh, to the development of disease. So the four topics I'm going to talk about very briefly each are these. Development of the cerebral cortex, the vast folded mantle that, that seems to be primarily involved in doing the, the cognitive things, the high-level things of perception and the consciousness and the decision-making and the control of um, high-level control and decision-making about movement and so on. Uh, language. Huntington's disease is one example of, um, of a neurodegenerative um, condition. Um, and also an example of, um, of an autosomal dominant genetic uh, disorder. Um, and finally, stroke, um, the commonest of all um, neurological um, conditions um, res responsible for um, an enormous uh, burden of disease throughout the world. So first, development of the cerebral cortex. Well, uh, the cerebral cortex in human beings is, is vast, but it has grown, as it were, through evolution gradually. There's been a progressive process. And the general organization and layout of the cerebral hemispheres, of the layers of the gray matter of the cortex, are, are very similar in, in, um, in human beings um, and other mammalian uh, species. This is a picture of uh, an 18th century picture, actually, of a, uh, of a human brain. Um, and you'll know that it's divided into, into lobes, a parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and frontal lobe. Uh, the general layout of th those, those um, areas is, is similar in, in all mammals. Um, and moreover, the disposition um, and uh, function of major areas responsible for sensory processing and the control of movement are very similar in their arrangement in, in mammals. The, the, uh, the precentral gyrus um, is responsible for the control of movement, con connecting directly to motor neurons in the spinal cord. And the body is laid out, as you know, from the, you know, the feet here to the, the, the hands and the face, um, uh, lower down in the gyrus. Um, and running parallel with that is a re region, the postcentral gyrus, which receives input from the body, from the tissues of the body, from the skin and the deep tissues of the body, laid out in the same topographic arrangement and, uh, to a large extent, interconnected with the, uh, with the motor cortex. There's a visual area at the, at the, at the back, the occipital uh, pole, um, and uh, an auditory area here at the top of the, the temporal lobe. Now, that picture could have been drawn by a neurologist at the turn of the last century, 1900. Um, these, this was broadly known from the effects of damage um, to, to the brain in humans, the deficits produced by local damage, focal damage, stroke, and so on, um, in the human brain. Um, before any of the modern research involving microelectrodes, looking at the characteristics of individual neurons and, and how they, they function. So this much was, was known. And uh, moreover, from comparative studies in animals, it's clear that that general pattern of disposition of the sensory and motor um, areas was established right at the beginning of the mammalian line and conserved through the whole of, of, um, of mammalian evolution. So if you look, for instance, at, um, let's say, uh, a hedgehog as a representative of early insectivores at the beginning of the, uh, the placental uh, mammalian line, the disposition of the somatic sensory, the touch areas here, um, the visual areas here at the back, this is the back, that's the front, um, and the um, auditory cortex, the green area, the basic arrangement of those is similar to what one finds in a cat, or in a sheep, or, or in a monkey, uh, and in a human being. But, although the sizes, of course, are not to scale here, but, uh, the human cortex is hugely um, disproportionately large compared with that, let's say, of a hedgehog. But what is clear is that a much larger fraction of the whole surface of the cortex is occupied by those basic sensory processing areas in a hedgehog than in a human being. 
What's happened during evolution, to a large extent, has been the addition of this extra stuff. What um, I suppose a 19th century neurologist neurologist would have called association cortex, or even in some cases silent cortex, as if it was uncommitted in its functions and was somehow perhaps just receiving signals from the committed areas and processing them in clever ways um, and perhaps responsible to, for thoughts and intelligence and those high-level things. Of course, we know that in reality, the rest of the cortex in higher um, uh, mammals is filled with a mosaic of committed, computationally committed um, areas, uh, many of them actually distinctive and recognizable by fine detail of their his histology, um, each probably responsible for processing a particular aspect of an incoming sensory signal or a particular aspect of, the, of, of an outgoing motor um, command. Well, if the human cortex has evolved progressively and gradually from some kind of early skeletal arrangement, then uh, there is hope that the conservation of, of the control mechanisms might mean that one can legitimately look at those mechanisms in, in lower animals, in lower mammals. And that has of, has, of course, driven a great deal of research on the development of the cortex, because there is very little that one can do in, 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 um, in human beings <coughs> to to look at processes with the precision um, that modern techniques give um, in animals. This is a mouse, this is a beautiful um, video made with optical projection tomography, a method developed in the Human Genetics Unit in, in Edinburgh. Um, and it shows a mouse embryo um, at, uh, as you can see, 10 and a half um, days, post-conceptual days. Um, and the embryo has been selectively um, stained, monoclonal uh, antibody staining, to reveal two transcription factors, SOX6 and PAX6, which were expressed very early on in the development of the nervous system. And you can see that they're differentially expressed, very precisely differentially expressed within the, uh, the nervous system, defining territories within which gene expression is being regulated differently, already partitioning up the brain into committed um, regions. Um, the general arrangement, the way in which the cerebral cortex develops its layers has been studied not only in rodents but in other species, and there's every reason to believe that it's basically similar um, hum in human beings. Uh, the forebrain starts uh, as a vesicle, the telencephalic vesicle, the walls of which are made largely from stem cells, from neural precursor stem cells, which are proliferating rapidly symmetrically proliferating, not yet producing neurons, as the forebrain vesicle grows in size, the telencephalon grows in size, and suddenly at a critical stage, uh, those stem cells start to produce uh, differentiated post-mitotic committed cells, uh, some of which become neurons. They migrate upwards, here are the stem cells here at uh, early ages in the so-called ventricular zone, the wall of the, uh, uh, of the telencephalon, which will become the forebrain. Um, and then they start to produce neurons which migrate upwards. And the first of those, the earliest of those neurons, and this is based on relatively recent work in, uh, in, in mice um, and rats, the first of those neurons um, are, not, are not mature type neurons which are going to participate in later circuitry. They're the so-called preplate. They're a transient population, many of them die, and they probably largely pair, play a role in organizing the rest of the development. At a certain stage, the stem cells, the same stem cells probably in many cases, start to produce um, other classes of neurons which are genuine cortical neurons, which form a kind of sandwich. They migrate upwards along the processes um, of, uh, uh, of, of the neural precursors to take their place, splitting the uh, original preplate into two layers, the so-called marginal zone, which becomes layer one of the mature cortex, and then the subplate region below. And gradually these cells accumulate as more and more of them migrate, um, the later arriving ones moving up towards the top of the cortex in an inside-out sequence, um, and that, that forms the familiar six layers of the, of, of the neocortex. Again, every reason to believe that that's similar from the crude methods that um, can or had been applied in human beings until quite, um, until quite recently. But a crucial question, it, of course, in knowing how a bit, a bit of brain works is to know how connections are formed. And for the cerebral cortex, a crucial part of the connectivity is that which brings sensory information in to those distinct specified regions. 
the somatic sensory cortex, the visual cortex, and the auditory cortex. And it's known that in all mammals, including humans, um, that general topographic arrangement of those areas is determined by projections from different nuclei within the thalamus, a subcortical structure which has co-evolved with the cerebral cortex, um, to which the sense, sense organs project. So here's the thalamus hidden down below the cerebral hemispheres, and it consists of a number of uh, nuclei receiving information from the ears, from the somatic sensory surface, in this case the whiskers um, of, this, of this mouse, and from the eyes to different regions of the thalamus. Then each region of the thalamus, there's a relay, a synaptic relay, and the thalamic cells then project up to the correct regions of the cortex. So each bit of the cortex, in the marmoset, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the hedgehog, in the human being, each, each bit of the cortex that's going to become a particular sensory area receives its sensory input from a particular um, area of the thalamus. So how is that achieved? And I'll just describe very briefly some work that Zoltan Molnar did in my uh, lab starting many years ago, um, in which we um, uh, asked questions about the molecular, the possible molecular control of the process of ingrowth of fi fibers into the developing cortex from the thalamus. And we chose to approach that n initially, not by studying it in, in the whole embryonic brain, but by, by trying to produce some in vitro and reduced preparation. And I'm glad to say that uh, part of this research was funded by a foundation which supports research on the replacement of live um, animals. Uh, we were using um, tissue culture. Tissue culture, it must be said, fra of fragments of neural tissue which of course retrieve from um, living um, animals. But, the, but the, uh, the, the main part of the experiment was done in vitro. What we, were, were, what we wanted to do was to see whether we could produce a model of the way in which axons from the thalamus invade the embryonic cortex and then use that to define uh, molecular mechanisms that were controlling that process. So we um, took samples of uh, very early developing cerebral cortex, usually at around the time of birth in mice or rats. The early experiments were in, in rats. And combined them in tissue culture in organotypic culture with small fragments of the thalamus, from distinct regions of the thalamus um, taken either at birth or, or before birth. Uh, we knew from the living animal that, that axons are growing into the cerebral cortex from the thalamus a few days before birth, so we could look at the timing, the age, the effect of the age of those different components in the circuitry. Well, we found to our, um, our great pleasure that, that fibres would grow from the thalamus into the cortex in these conditions, and we could label the thalamic block with a, with a carbocyanin fluorescent dye and therefore look at the axons, and here they are in fluorescence microscopy, growing into the slice of cortex. This is a slice of cortex lying in culture, and growing in in, in a manner that looks very similar to the normal ingrowth of fibres that you see in the living um, embryo. But uh, an interesting feature emerged when we combined um, slices of cortex taken at birth with thalamic fragments from just before birth. The thalamic fibers grew in, but did not stop growing. And you see here, they ascend to the surface. Some of them, well, here's one which has which turned through 90 degrees near the surface and is growing off horizontally through the cortex in a way that you never see um, in vivo. They normally grow in and then stop at the fourth layer of the cortex, which is the classical receiving area where the neurons um, have synapses on them from incoming thalamic fibers. So what, one of the things that we showed by taking slices of cortex at later and later ages was that the, the cortex suddenly turns on a signal associated with the developing layer four, what we call a stop signal, um, at around three days after birth in, in the rat, um, which uh, terminates the growth uh, of thalamic axons um, causes them generally to, to bifurcate and then uh, for the growth cones to collapse, they form synapses. Um, earlier, the cortex turns on a, a growth permissive factor that allows thalamic fibers to invade. They don't invade before a couple of days before birth and begin to invade uh, very shortly um, afterwards. So we were able to reveal a cascade of factors that seem to control the ingrowth of the cortex. Well, an obvious question then is, um, uh, is the specificity of interconnections between different thalamic sensory nuclei and the appropriate receiving area of the cortex, is that somehow predetermined by some kind of molecular tag or key 
that's appropriate for that connection alone. What's going to be the visual cortex has a kind of chemical tag on it which attracts axons from the visual part of the thalamus. And to look at that question, we did this very simple experiment. Um, we grew a, a single fragment of thalamus, in this case from the visual part of the thalamus, the part that would receive information from the eyes, in association with two fragments of cortex. One, the occipital cortex, the appropriate bit of cortex to which it should project, and then another bit of irrelevant cortex, the frontal cortex, to which it would never connect. And what we found, to our surprise, was that connectivity was indistinguishable. So connections simply depended, the, the ability to form connections just depended on the proximity of thalamic axons to, the, to any bit of cortex available. What mattered then was how the thalamic fibres are guided to the appropriate region and delivered to the appropriate region because they will connect to anything. Well, we looked at that by um, a technique uh, of labelling that had just been um, developed and has been very influential in developmental studies. The application of these carbocyanin dyes, which you can get in different colours, um, and these dyes are, are lipid soluble, they incorporate into the membranes of fixed neurons. So this, this can be done in fixed tissue, not in living tissue. And they slowly diff diffuse along the axons and you can use them to trace connectivity even in dead tissue. So here we are looking at a cross section. Um, uh, this is a, a, a coronal section through one half of the brain of an E14 um, rat. Um, Gestation is about 21 days uh, in the rat. So here is the cerebral wall, and at this stage, it's just starting to develop neurons. It started a couple of days before in the lateral part here, and it's just, um, um, at this stage, just started in the medial part to produce neurons, which are moving up to become those early preplate neurons, the transient po population. Here's the dorsal thalamus. Those are the neurons which have the task of sending their axons up to the appropriate region of the cortex. And it's already a pretty tortuous um, route. Those cells only arrived a couple of days before from the place where they were, were born, and they, they don't form distinguishable nuclei at this stage. Um, now, one of the te techniques that we used involved implanting tiny crystals of carbocyanin dyes, either into the cerebral wall at different points or into the thalamus at different points, to examine the interconnections, the, the, whether axons are produced in one direction or the other. And in fact, the first projections that you see within the pathway are produced from the cortex, from those very early born transient preplate neurons which are going to die. Here they are, presumably, doing part of their role in guiding uh, subsequent uh, connections. So here, a little crystal has been placed in the surface of the cortex. It has labelled stem cells by diffusion. Here you see um, the so-called radial glial cells, which are neural pre pre precursors. But here at the surface are um, preplate cells which have only migrated into position a few hours before, already spinning off axons, growing down in a sort of parallel, nicely organized bundle towards this region, towards what will, be, will become the internal capsule uh, between the telencephalon and subcortical structures. If you put a crystal into the dorsal thalamus at the same time, you find that axons are growing upwards from the dorsal thalamus. And if you get the two placements right, if you put it into the correct region of the cortex, the one which you're supposed to receive from that thalamic nucleus and the correct region of the thalamus, you get beautiful pictures like this. Here the downward fibres are stained in green and the upward fibres are stained in red and they meet each other and the thalamic fibres then grow over the surface of the cortical fibres guided towards the appropriate region which they then, after waiting for two or three days, invade and, and innovate. Well, of course, we, we, did, we worked for 10 or 15 years on this in, in rodents and with, we know we're, we're we're really interested in mice, they're super animals, but, but, the, but our real curiosity was to know what happens in humans. And we made the broad assumption that things would be similar, we could learn all the lessons from mice, find a few corroborating steps in studies in, in humans, and that would sew up the, the issue. Well, we started to work, and this is work with um, uh, postdoc in, in, in my, still in my lab in Oxford, Irina Bystron, looking at human embryos. A, a, a much harder task than, uh, than mice, of course. Uh, we ob ob obtain um, embryos from uh, surgical abortions from the MRC uh, Embryo Bank here in London and uh, in Newcastle. Um, the quality of the tissue is crucially important in using antibodies to stain, selectively to, to, uh, to stain uh, different proteins, different gene expression products. Here we are looking, uh, and we can, we can uh, use these techniques to look at embryos as early as four weeks post-conception. 
So here is um, an embryo at about four weeks post-conception. This is a picture of, um, uh, of one, one of the embryos that we studied. The whole embryo is about two and a half millimeters long. And, and you can see this curious structure at the head end. That's the neural tube, the, fold, the inward folding neural plate, which is going to become the brain, the spinal cord and the brain, which hasn't completely folded yet. And you can see here an illustration at this stage. There's still an opening in the neural tube at the head end, and here it is. Um, well, uh, we've done a great deal of work, and much of it, I'm very pleased to say, does indeed correlate very well with what's ha happening in mice. Um, these are very preliminary results, but here we are looking at uh, carbocyanin uh, dyes, revealing axons growing downwards here from the cortex at very early stages, Carnegie stage um, 18, about uh, five weeks. Um, um, post-conception, growing downwards towards the internal capsule. And here in uh, another example where a small crystal has been placed in the, the thalamus, just a little later, a bundle of thalamic axons growing upwards um, towards the uh, cerebral <coughs> wall. So it looks as though a very similar process is going on. We haven't yet examined in detail that handshake process of guidance, but it seems very likely that it's happening. However, one of the Visi visually dominant features of early embryos, which we had never seen in any other species or read about in any other species, was this population of, uh, of neurons. Here we are looking at the, uh, the cerebral wall at Carnegie stage 13. Um, uh, that's uh, around about the 32nd day. Um, and it's stained with um, an antibody for, neuro for a neuronal marker. So these, these things that are stained heavily here are neurons. They're in the surface of the, um, of the cerebral wall, in the preplate, that region to which neurons, uh, uh, um, which neurons invade from the local ventricular zone, from the stem cells. However, these neurons don't come from the local ventricular zone. And they arrive before there are any neurons being produced locally. They come, we know now, from a region of the ventricular zone which will become future hypothalamus and they spread out over the whole of the surface of the telencephalon. They're a very curious population of neurons. We call them predecessor neurons. Here's one in more detail. Here's the cell body. The cell body migrates through a long um, forward process by um, somatic translocation. This is not an axon. It's a process. They don't produce axons. Although they express neuronal markers, they don't produce axons. They anchor themselves in on the peel surface here, and then where they make contact through tight junctions with the apical processes of neural stem cells. And we think what they're doing is, um, is performing transcriptional control of neuronogenesis in other regions of the brain by communicating through um, tight junctions with, with them. Wherever they arrive, local neurogenesis turns on very shortly um, afterwards. This has been described in no other species. We and others now have looked extensively, even in monkeys, and have not seen neurons of this, this class. Whether it is a unique adaptation for the very large human brain, for some reason, we don't know. But the, an obvious warning here is uh, that lessons learned from animals are not necessarily entirely transfer, transformable, transferable to humans. Just a moment about language. Language, of course, is one of the most important things we do. It's a defining characteristic of human beings. Again, 19th century neurologists could tell us, well, actually not as much as we know about it, but quite a lot um, uh, of what we know of language now. They already knew that uh, strokes in two regions, of course, Broca's classic um, uh, observations, the effects of lesions in this region, the frontal cortex, close to the, the face and mouth representation of the um, primary motor cortex, the region known as Broca's area, which produces an aphasia in which the patient is still able to understand what's said to them. They're still able to read, uh, but they can't produce uh, speech. They can't produce organized speech. Huge difficulty in finding words, very, very primitive um, um, syntax. They just po can't put things together, even though can, they can understand them. On the other hand, lesions here at the junction of the temporal and occipital and parietal lobes of the Wernicke's area produces, as it were, the, the symmetrical um, uh, condition, uh, aphasia, of understanding. People with, with Wernicke's uh, aphasia um, uh, can't read. Uh, they can't understand what's said to them. They still pour out a sort of language with neologisms which look sort of syntactically uh, constructed, um, even though it's usually uh, non nonsensical. So this, 
this um, disjunction between understanding language and expressing language is beautifully demonstrated by not animal research. Animals don't speak and don't, I mean, there's, there's no evidence that any species has a fully developed syntactical communication system like um, human beings. Those observations are entirely derived from very simple um, clinical observations. And to be absolutely frank, we have not got that much further in understanding how language is done, even though it's so crucially important for understanding what human beings are. Um, we know a little bit about the connectivity. So here between Broca's area, there's strong interconnection with the face, mouth, tongue, larynx area of the, um, uh, of the motor cortex. Not surprisingly, because it's involved in, 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 um, in controlling, it's a kind of pre-motor control system for, for speech. Um, equally, Wernicke's area has strong inputs from um, the temporal cortex, from, from uh, um, areas involved in the analysis of speech sounds, but also from, uh, from visual areas. And interestingly, this connectivity, even from the primary visual cortex forward through um, areas moving upwards towards the parietal cortex, um, can be and has been studied um, by functional magnetic resonance imaging. Now, I'm sure so many of you have been wondering when I would raise the value of functional ma magnetic resonance imaging, and some of you might have expected that I would say, of course, these new neuroimaging techniques are completely displacing research on animals and will answer all of the questions. FMRI is incredibly um, important. A, a, a large fraction of neuroscientists um, make use of it. But there are two key factors that you have to keep in mind if you ask what it can contribute to understanding the brain. One is its relatively poor spatial resolution, a few millimeters at best. Uh, and the other is the long time constant of vascular responses on which fMRI is based, lasting a few seconds. So although it's useful for knowing pretty useful for knowing crudely where things are happening and roughly when they're happening in relation to stimuli. It will never give us the detail of, of knowledge that one can gain from the study of individual neurons in, in animals. But I'll show you one example of the way in which it can be used um, in the study of lang language mechanisms and their development, for instance. Um, and you know, we don't have for language the kinds of tools which can be applied so effectively in other areas where animal models are more appropriate. This is a, a nice study done by Bedney and colleagues a few years ago, um, in which they used three different stimuli. They put people into the scanner and looked at localized activity here, here, and here. The yellow thing in the middle is simply the overlap between the purple bit and the green. Three different stimuli producing activity in this region of occipital and um, inferior parietal um, regions. Well, what were the three stimuli? We know that the primary visual cortex is at the back here. Well, the stimuli were, to begin with, um, well, yes, this is the primary visual cortex, respond, which responds very well to static patterns, just black and white or colored patterns, even when they're stationary. But if you move those patterns, either with, with just straightforward motion like this or even sort of complicated things like transparent motion, you produce activity selectively in this this group of areas here, shown in blue, including this region, V5 or MT, which seems to be very, from animal studies, from monkey studies, we know is very, very committed to the computation of visual motion. The green area was selectively activated by another form of motion called biological motion. And it looks like this. It's this sort of thing. Okay, which all of you will instantly see, I'm sure, as a moving figure. It's computer generated consisting of a number of dots which are basically doing the same things as these dots, just making local movements. But it's the relationships between the movements which tell you that this is a, a, an image of a person moving. Uh, similarly, you could distinguish a man and a woman or different animals simply from the pattern of movement of the articulations of the joints. And we are crucially sensitive to that. And it's a pretty important biological signal to us, very, very useful. It turns out we have an area of our cortex which is committed to it there. So you can imagine that during evolution, as the additional cortex has been added, starting with a hedgehog-type brain that just has very early, simple visual processing, these extra computational bits are added on to do clever things like recognizing and analyzing motion and even biological motion. Well, then what about the purple bit? Um, is that just another ever more elaborate form of motion which is being analyzed? Well, the stimulus that generated the response in the purple region of the brain was verbs, spoken verbs or written verbs. Uh, now, not all verbs are verbs of motion, of course, but I think 
you know, probably early verbs, the sort of ver verbs that would have been used by Paleolithic people, probably were largely verbs of motion, no carry, stab, hunt, whatever. Um, so it, it, is it so surprising that the system for analyzing verbs might have grown out of some kind of se sequential chain of evolutionary development associated with the detection of movement? And this area here, it's the right hemisphere, it's true, but this area here on the other side is bang in the middle of Wernicke's area, the area responsible for um, analyzing and understanding uh, language. There's a similar area on the right, but it's, it's less dominant in most right-handed people. So that's a kind of just-so story based on fMRI. Wouldn't it be wonderful to know in the kind of detail that we have about the processing of visual information in this area, coming from two decades of exquisite work on monkeys, on awake monkeys, wouldn't it be wonderful to have that kind of knowledge of what's going on in this area? And we, we may never have that. Um, Huntington's disease, briefly. Huntington's disease is a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, it is um, interesting and different because it's an autosomal dominant disorder. If you've got the gene, you will get the, um, the, the disorder. It's also distinctive in the region of brain that, that principally degenerates. Huntington's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disease, although it's usually of quite late onset. Um, it has both cognitive and motor symptoms. The, the, the dominant ones are motor, the, the, the uncontrollable movements, the career form movements, and so on. But there are cognitive symptoms as, as well. It affects about 1 in 10,000 of the population, at least in Western countries. 95% uh, of, uh, of cases are late onset, that is after having children. That's um, you know, in some respects very sad because it means that the, the genetics is transmitted. Um, and it's associated particularly with selective degeneration of the corpus striatum, the sub, uh, uh, basal ganglia um, structure, subcortical structure, uh, closely involved in the control of, of movement. And here we are looking at a cross-section through the brain of a normal human, and here one with as you hugely enlarged ventricles because of the collapse of the, of the corpus um, striatum in, in a person suffering uh, uh, from, from Huntington's disease. The gene for Huntington's was the first gene identified for um, a, an autosomal dominant um, neurological disorder. Um, identified, it was cloned in 1993. Um, it, the nature of the gene is fully understood. It's a triplet repeat uh, gene. It has an expanded um, polyglutamine sequence in it. Um, so it generates a protein that has a long, um, a long sequence. Um, this means that um, the genes understood, the protein is very well known, the expression patterns even in the human are quite well known, and there is an absolute, at least in these terms, perfect animal model. In fact, there are a number of them. I think the most, most uh, convincing of them was developed in London by Jill Bates, um, a variety of, of, of mice in which the exon of the human mutant gene was inserted into the mouse genome, so it produces mutant human mutant protein, Huntington protein as it's called. Um, and that generates a mouse which dies young, develops motor disorders, also as, as we've shown in some of our work, has cognitive difficulties and a variety of other conditions. It is the most comprehensively compelling mouse model of any neurological or, or um, psychiatric condition that I, that I know of. Uh, one thing we, we've, uh, and my lab worked on Huntington's for several years, one of the things that we discovered, which was nice because it turned out to have a clinical, an un, a previously unknown clinical correlation, um, the mutant gene has associated with it a reduction in neurogenesis in the adult brain. You'll know, I'm sure, that there are certain small regions of the, ad, of the adult mammalian brain that continue pr to produce neurons throughout life, principally the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, which pushes neurons into the hippocampus, replacing neurons, and that probably plays a part in, in memory processes and actually in the forgetting process, it's, it's thought. And there's a, an anterior stream of neurogenesis which shunts new, new neurons into the piriform cortex and into the olfactory bulb, part of the olfactory system. And it turns out that the mutant gene in the mice, we discovered, reduces neurogenesis dramatically in both of those sites. So here we are looking at... Uh, Neurogenesis, in the, the, this is the percentage of cells um, that are dividing um, in the dentate gyrus and in piriform cortex. 
um, in mice carrying the Huntington's gene compared with wild type mice, and huge differences in both cases. This is a dramatic reduction. So we thought, well, if there's a reduction in neurogenesis, there were going to be problems with, with memory and problems with olfaction. But well, we certainly demonstrated the problems with memory, and that correlates well with the cognitive disorders that are detectable in clinical patients. Diagnose clinical patients because you can genotype before the onset of motor symptoms. But what we predicted was that there would also be problems with the discrimination of smell, the detection of smell. Um, this, is, um, uh, this is in the mouse, in the mutant mouse, double cortin staining for immature neurons in the piriform cortex. Here in the wild type mouse, lots of uh, newly born neurons, and here in the Huntington's uh, mouse, very, very few. Um, we tested olfactory discrimination in the mice, and it was very poor on olfactory detection, and, and moved into a very small clinical study where we showed that um, uh, patients um, diagnosed, genotyped uh, with the Huntington's gene, but with no obvious other symptoms, um, had difficulty in discriminating odours, um, and also um, in detecting odours, the detection um, threshold. So it's quite likely there's similar defects happening in human patients. Now, this is a preamble to a... A, a, a lesson um, about the value of commitment to the three R's, frankly. Uh, while, I was, while we were doing this work, one of my then graduate students, a Rhodes Scholar, um, a neurosurgeon from South Africa, um, Anton van Dellen, wanted to run experiments on, the, the, uh, on improving the quality of the life of laboratory animals. Because after all, the normal cage conditions for lab mice like this a really pretty um, unimpressive, uh, a couple of mice, two or three mice living in a, in a cage, and that's it. So what he did was um, to introduce uh, randomly within mouse um, cages in the animal house um, enrichment. Odd things just put into the cage, changed every couple of days to give the mice something to play with. But it turned out that the mice that he was doing this with were also involved in the, in the study on Huntington's. We were producing Huntington's mice from... Um, um, uh, from heterozygous parents, so some of the offspring were carrying the gene, some were not, some were wild type, and we didn't know which were which until we broke the code at the end of the, the various studies that we were doing. So this was a, an unplanned, a nice uh, unplanned uh, double-blind experiment, because some of the Huntington's disease mice, and we didn't know which ones that, that ha were um, mutant, um, were being exposed to the enriched environment, and others were not. And lo and behold, when we carried out the normal kinds of diagnostic testing that we did on the mice, we found a separation between the two and we broke the code. So here, for instance, and this, and this was confirmed in every test, cognitive and otherwise, that we looked at with these mice. Here's a simple test in which the mice are put onto a wooden rod and uh, they, they, they walk out to the end of the, the rod. There's, there's bedding and so on underneath. They play around with the rod and then eventually, when they get a bit tired, they fall off. Um, at least they do if, they, if they're suffering any motor disorder. Wild-type mice can stay there for a long time. So we had a sort of little test of their uh, coordination ability. And here we are looking at the non-enriched, the normal mutant mice, and this is the percentage of the group of mice that were failing this rod test as a function of age. And here we are, even from about 60 days on, some of them are already failing. And 100, 120 days, all of them are failing that very simple test. They're in really bad shape by this stage. But here, it matched randomly allocated group uh, with enrichment. Um, very few of them had detectable symptoms, um, even out to 160 days. So this is equivalent, if you like to translate it in simplistic terms of human beings, I mean, equivalent of delaying the onset of the motor disorder by many, many years. And this is in an autosomal dominant condition which had previously thought to be just absolutely uh, uh, autonomous and inevitable and progressive. There's nothing that one could do about it. Um, it, also, it also rescues um, the degenerative changes in the striatum. In the mouse, the striatum collapses. But here we are looking at, uh, at Huntington's, the mutant mice living in an enriched environment, not statistically distinguishable from wild-type mice. But if they're... Um, a, a, uh, if they're uh, non-enriched here, there's a, there's a, um, a, a significant collapse, uh, even at this quite early stage, um, in the volume of the corpus striatum. So enrichment slows down, or to a large extent prevents, for some considerable time, the degeneration of the striatum. 
Well, the nice thing about dis that little discovery, and by the way, that has now been demonstrated in virtually all neuro n other neurodegenerative conditions in animal models, that enrichment of the environment delays the progress of the disease. But what we, um, what we realized was that enrichment now provided us with a tool to separate trivial consequences from the mutation from things that might be critical in pathogenesis. Because we could, for any particular change, molecular change, anatomical change, behavioral change, we could ask, is this change modified by enriching the environment? Because we, know, we knew that enriching the environment significantly delayed the progress of the disease. And the, um, perhaps the most interesting work that came out of that was a study by Tara Spars, um, now in Edinburgh, now um, a Chancellor's Fellow in, um, in Edinburgh, um, as part of her, her DPhil in, in uh, my group, looking at the expression of um, a growth factor, an important, an important neuronal growth factor, BDNF, brain-derived neural, uh, uh, neurotrophic factor, in different parts of the brain. And what she found was that in mutant mice, using quantitative um, uh, Western blotting, in mutant mice, there's a significant reduction in the amount of BDNF specifically in the corpus striatum. Well, that's interesting because BDNF is a growth factor. It helps to, to, to support and sustain neurons. So was it possible that a reduction in BDNF expression or availability in the striatum was causing the degeneration and therefore the disease? One wouldn't know without a control. And the control is enrichment. Because enrichment delays the disease. The question is, does it also delay the decrease in BDNF expression, and it does. So there's a nice precise correlation between those. So what we suggested on the basis of this and a large amount of other work was a hypothesis for the pathogenesis. Um, and frankly, the pathogenesis of Huntington's disease was not, and well, even now is not fully understood. Um, but our suggestion was that BDNF produced by cortical neurons, and we knew that expression even in the mutant mice was normal in the cortex is transported along corticostriatal neurons, particularly from frontal cortex, into the striatum. And that transport is interfered with by the mutant Huntington protein. Uh, there's other parallel evidence that, uh, that that protein is involved in vesicular transport, so this isn't um, so stupid and uh, so entirely uh, uh, irrational idea. So the, the mutant protein uh, might reduce the amount of BDNF re reaching the striatum, therefore causing uh, degenerative change and hence precipitating the cascade of, of symptoms. Well, there it sat. The last line of our paper said this um, might offer a new approach to therapy, but ah, uh, yes, um, agonists of the receptor for BDNF don't cross the blood brain um, barrier. I mean, there are big problems with um, BDNF um, agonists. However, the FDA has very recently given approval for um, a clinical trial, an early um, clinical trial, to a group um, in the University of California in Davis, um, directed by Jan Nolta, who proposed, proposed to use genetically modified mesenchymal stem cells derived from donors, from human donors, from bone marrow, um, genetically transformed so that they overexpress BDNF, di directly injected into the straight into the corpus striatum of patients, um, uh, genotyped patients. And the basis of this, which has con convinced the, uh, the FDA, is the fact that um, such stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, harvested from bone marrow, transformed genetically, and then injected into the mouse model of Huntington's disease, delays, virtually prevents the onset of symptoms, in a way very similar to environmental enrichment. So their plan, and here we are looking at a, um, a, a section of the striatum stained for neurons, the blue, blue cells are neurons, the green cells are mesenchymal stem cells overexpressing um, BDNF. So the clinical trial um, moves to, in this case, to humans with um, intracerebral injection into the striatum of the uh, modified stem cells in the hope that this will alleviate the condition. Um, no, we, keeping our fingers crossed, could it, be, it would be very nice to think that um, a, di um, a discovery stimulated entirely by fundamental research questions might eventually lead to translation of that sort. Finally, and briefly, stroke. Uh, stroke, a very common condition and um, very debilitating and very expensive. 
uh, caused, of course, by the occlusion of blood supply to a region of the brain or, or by um, hemorrhage. Um, here, here, for instance, these are scans which show the, the blue penumbra of subsequent bleeding around an area of initial stroke. And a lot of changes which go on around a stroke in which associated cortex dies far beyond the region that's been immediately Im impacted by the ischemia or by the, or the, by the bleeding associated with the, with the stroke. And the drug companies, of course, have been very interested in whether one might prevent, in some way, the additional damage in uh, the neurotoxic damage in the region around uh, a stroke. This has been a graveyard, frankly, for preclinical studies, as many of you will know. Here, just a few of the, the papers, trouble with animal models, do stroke models, model stro stroke, and so on. And the reason, reason is 500 neuroprotective treatment strategies, drug strategies, have been developed with very encouraging preclinical results. Um, but as this re fairly recent paper concluded, only aspirin and um, intravenous uh, thrombolysis uh, have any certain clinical value. It's been a catastrophic failure of the tra transition between um, preclinical and clinical, seized with glee by some of our um, opponents, of course, as being typical of the failures of preclinical work on animals and its non-transferability to humans. Just to quote, though, from the same article, exactly the same article, in a review of animal studies published in seven leading journals of high impact, about one-third of the studies, preclinical studies, did translate at the level of human randomized trials. And a tenth of the interventions were, were subsequently approved uh, for use in humans. Glass half full, or glass one-tenth full, or, or 90% empty, I don't know. But it seems to me that 10% you know, isn't, isn't bad when one recognizes the difficulty of transfer from animal um, studies to, to humans. And the fact is that um, you know, we wouldn't need animal preclinical um, studies um, if uh, we had the ability to do everything to develop and to test a new drug on, on uh, humans. But an alternative way of putting that is that um, you know, hum human studies are essential to discover whether uh, therapies that appear to be effective in animals can be transferred to humans and are and are safe. There's an essential interplay um, between the two. Uh, what has come out um, largely of the analysis and the um, agonizing about the failures of the preclinical stroke, stroke studies is actually a lot more scrutiny in the, in the design of preclinical um, animal studies. Even with suggestions such as this, from a recent paper, uh, that they should be subject to very similar designs, protocols, controls, um, management um, as, um, as clinical studies, with uh, different study sites being involved in pre-designed uh, animal studies, with much more scrutiny about numbers and power and statistical um, design, that there should be a steering committee, very similar to that for a clinical trial, uh, and so on, that preclinical CROs might be responsible for this, uh, this kind of study. There's certainly a lot of re-examination re of the validity of animal research at every level um, because of criticism of inadequate numbers, inadequate power calculations, inadequate comparability, and in some cases, poor experimental design. I think that's something that we have to accept and do better. It is not a reason for saying that animal research can never work and should be abandoned because abandoning this crucial phase in the development of new um, treatments would be catastrophic for the patients, for instance, helped by the 10% of, uh, of, uh, of drug, drug studies that do transfer right through directly to clinical benefits. So finally, to conclude, what can we learn from all of this, apart from lessons about those individual areas of research? What I've tried to do is to give a picture of balance balance the value of animals of studies on animals when there is no alternative, uh, when the work simply cannot be done on humans, and where the animal model is appropriate for understanding human beings, which is not always. Um, the great difficulty, I think, is, and it's not, it's not unique, but it's certainly true in this area, is the, increasing, is the continuing polarization within this debate about the importance of animals. Opponents to animal research, 
often certainly employing exaggerated and, 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 and sometimes you know, factually incorrect um, arguments, but equally the supporters on our side are often equally exaggerating the benefits, um, exaggerating the difficulty of, of conducting parallel studies or equivalent studies in, in human beings and so on. Um, avoiding that kind of polarization by admitting the difficulties in some cases as well as the advantages in others I think is absolutely crucial. Um, uh, just to give you an example of the um, one of the uh, most problematical issues, which is selective quotation in drawing on the opinions and evidence of others. Well, what did Darwin think about um, animal experimentation? Well, he said this. You ask about my opinion on vivisection, I quite agree that it's justifiable for real investigations on physiology. But he also said this. It is a subject which makes me sick with horror, so I will not say another word about it, else I shall not sleep tonight. And interestingly, he said both things in the same letter. This is the full text of a letter to Ray Lancaster. But not the mere damnable and detestable curiosity. So he was making a distinction between valuable research and, and useful investigations in physiology, perhaps applicable, uh, with, with just tinkering for no benefit at all. So one should be very careful with quotation. So I want to raise just some questions which I think need, we all need to um, ad address. Do we really have adequate ways of assessing the validity of the animal models we use? It seems to be crucial, if, particularly if they're part of a preclinical study. Is there more scope for, for developing alternatives? The um, kinds of te technical advances being made in human study um, are making things possible in humans now that were not in the past, and we must must recognize that and not, not, not those of us who have been committed to animal work not deny it. Yes, and is there sufficient funding available for the areas of new opportunity? Um, on the other hand, is medical progress being impeded by um, excessive bureaucratic regulation? I'm, and by excessive, I mean not demonstrably valuable in terms of maintaining ethical standards or, 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 the, um, or the correctness of, of procedure. Um, I, I think, you know, those of us who deal with the problem of applying for animal licenses, and not that I do anymore, but those of those whom I know still who, who deal with it, do wonder from time to time whether the benefits that are gained by the enormous amount of um, bureaucracy uh, uh, associated with the process are matched by benefits uh, to the animals and benefits in terms of the value of the, the research. And how effective is the evaluation of of evidence from animal research before it transfers into clinical uh, trials. And particularly, of course, um, how justified is the use of primates, how justified is genetic modification, and especially uh, how justified are we in using techniques that are, are almost bound to cause um, suffering. Um, so with those thoughts, um, I'd like you to think about the brain. It's a, it's a, no crucial um, issue because of those dilemmas that I raised right at the start. Um, it's a, f a wonderfully exciting area of science. It's incredibly important clinically because of the magnitude of the problems that need to be solved. But at the heart of that whole, those, those driving forces towards science on the brain, there is the conundrum that it is the organ that makes us think, that makes us know, and that makes us suffer. Thank you.